I will introduce myself again. My name is Erica Winters, and I work for Oregon's Constant Gardener, and I get to talk to awesome people like you all day. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about the most common pests found in the Willamette Valley. I'm going to go over the most common ones really briefly because I really want to focus on micromites and root aphids tonight. And then after that, I will invite Michelle Wiseman up on stage. Um, she will be talking a lot about pathogens that affect cannabis. And I also believe we'll get a little bit of information about viruses, which is a really elusive category of pathogens on cannabis. And lastly, to round our bases, we've invited the Oregon Department of Agriculture out. And Grant Jackson has driven all the way down from Salem tonight to join us. And he'll be talking a little bit about their guidelines and cannabis and pesticides and how our recommendations on the retail floor affect you guys uh, when it comes time to testing. So, bugs. How many of us have dealt with bugs? Um, anybody never dealt with bugs in the garden? All right, okay. So this is something we're all pretty well versed on. Um, today I wanna talk about the indoor uh, common pests, the outdoor common pests. We're gonna talk about micromites in depth tonight, and then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about root aphids. I wanna go back over IPM. Uh, last month our topic was growing sustainably, and uh, sustainable practices and integrated pest management is really important to Constant Gardener. So we're gonna touch on those four controls again, and I'm gonna make some recommendations for treating these pests. I'm also going to do a demonstration tonight with a live cannabis plant in a heat treatment dunking station and give you guys uh, some techniques, some really economical techniques for preventing pests. And lastly, we'll talk about sustainability. Fungus gnats, spider mites, thrips, and caterpillars. Most of us have had to deal with these at some point or another in the indoor garden. And they, uh, they, they, they are found in both, uh, outdoors and indoors. Uh, some tend to be found more outdoors than indoors, like caterpillars. Um, although I've personally dealt with caterpillars indoors as well. If you see little white butterflies flying around your indoor garden or greenhouse, they are not your friend. They are not your friend. They will turn into the type of caterpillars that will destroy your cannabis plants. So beware of that. Um, I'm going to go over some of the, the, the application recommendations for how to deal with some of these guys. First of all, fungus gnats. Now this is barely a pest. It's more of a nuisance. But they can cause some problems unintentionally. So their job is decomposers. So they're breaking down organic material in the soil and they're naturally occurring here in our area. Now every once in a while as they take a bite, they miss and they take a bite out of your all important root. And if you open that up to a wound, you may invite in damage, um, any kind of pathogens that might be present in your soil, or if you accidentally overwater it that day, it's going to be a lot more susceptible to issues. But for the most part, these guys are pretty benign when checked. So up in the left-hand corner there, so these are the larvae. They live in the soil, and again, they are just eating up that cocoa fiber and all those good organic inputs in your soil. Um, one of their trademark features is that little black dot at the top of their head, and this is a one millimeter grid. So they're anywhere from about four to five millimeters in length. Um, you can see them with the naked eye, of course, if you just dig around, and they generally live in the top three inches of, of your soil surface. Now the adults are often mistaken for fruit flies and sometimes mistaken for adult root aphid colonizers. I'm gonna show you a slide about that later, but I love this side by side. It gives you a really good image. So um, of course we've got our fruit fly on the right and we've got our fungus gnat here on the left and there's some pretty noticeable differences. When I'm watching their behavior in the garden, what I'm looking for is flight pattern. That gives me a really good clue. So your fungus gnat typically flies around in odd, uneven circles like it's been drinking too much, where your fruit fly flies in very sharp Z patterns. So just behavior alone can give you a lot of information about the insect that you're looking at. Now these are really easy to get rid of. Like thrips, you have to treat above and below because they do have a soil dwelling stage. And those adult flyers, their job is to make more babies. So if you don't catch the adults, your cycle will continue. Um, really easy with biologicals to treat. I never recommend that people pour organic oils into their soil. If you're an organic gardener, that's gonna cause major problems for microbiology. I hear azatrol works great for fungus gnat larvae, but holy smokes, it's $62 a pint. 
we can do a lot more for a lot less. So I like nematodes. Predatory nematodes are an incredible way to seek and destroy these larvae, and also the Bt bacteria that was mentioned earlier. And check your labels. There's two subspecies of Bt bacteria that gardeners work with, Bti, Israeliensis. My little mnemonic for remembering that is Israeliensis is for in the soil pests. And then Bt kerstaki with a K, uh, Bt kills caterpillars, K for caterpillars. So that's helped me sort those two in my head. And they are not interchangeable. So definitely check your labels. Uh, for the adults, just use sticky traps. It works really well. Sticky traps can sometimes be a little expensive, and it's a lot of paper and glue resources. Um, I do have some friends that use things like Tanglefoot or beeswax. You can also use duct tape and make little inverted collars and set them about the soil, or just line the whole plastic pot with a strip of duct tape, and they will stick right to it. It really works. Uh, so yeah, these guys, very, very benign, not a big deal. Spider mites. How many people have dealt with spider mites in the room? Boo! So generally around here we deal with the two-spotted variety. Um, and there's also another category of, of spider mites called red mites. Um, but they're not red, they're generally black in our area. They also appear as brown, yellow, or green. Now spider mite control is really important because their generations are so rapid that it can quickly get out of hand. So if you're actively treating an infestation, I'm going to recommend that you treat every three days because every three days another generation is hatching. And if you're not ahead of the game, you're behind. So uh, there's a lot of great biological treatments that will work, but you have to release them at the right time. If you've got 100,000 spider mites and you send in 1,000 predators, you've already lost. So we've got to talk about tipping the scales on your numbers, introducing biologicals earlier. Um, and this is a place in veg where organic oils do a really good job of knocking them back. I'm a big fan of neem oil uh, for spider mites. Thrips were mentioned a little bit, so I won't dive too deep, but I did want to show you guys some of the damage signs. From a distance, thrip damage can resemble spider mite damage. Instead of being tiny little stipling marks, however, you'll see these larger tunnels coalesce into larger spots that have been chewed clean. And one of their biggest telltale signatures is a silvery slug trail that they leave behind on the leaves. It looks just like a slug trail. It is their frass, and it's a great indicator that they are present. Um, now, the larvae are the, the bad guys. These are what are feeding on your leaves. Um, generally, they're on the undersides, so turn those over regularly. It's going to look like a little five millimeter worm. Squish them with your fingers, spray them with peroxide, some organic neem oil if you're in veg. These are really easy to get on top of. Just make sure you treat the soil as well with either predatory nematodes or Bt. I know I'm going through these fast for a 20 minute presentation. I've got a lot to cover, so thank you for, for bearing with me. Uh, briefly, caterpillars, loopers, leaf hoppers. Generally, again, these are a bigger deal outdoors. Um, although I have seen my fair share indoors in rural areas, especially when you live in the grasslands, these are ever present. So yeah, caterpillars, macro pests that take macro bites. Just for giggles, I put a caterpillar in a Ziploc bag with a fan leaf. I came back two hours later, it was gone. There was a skeleton of the veins left. One caterpillar, two hours, one leaf. Just to give you a sense of how devastating the damage can be. And of course, when we get into flower, they like to poop all over your buds, and they cause a lot of disease issues too, and I'll let Michelle cover the, the bud rot end of things. But these can also be managed biologically. You guys outdoors should be treating this right now, like two weeks ago right now. Um, the white moths are flying, and there are over 200 different types of caterpillars and loopers in our valley. Um, Bt is a really good spray. Can anybody tell me which subspecies of Bt I'd want to use? Not for caterpillars. Kursaki. You got the K. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. BTK. Absolutely. And uh, this bacteria is very UV sensitive. So it's going to break down in light really quick. So if you have an infestation or it is prime time for preventatively treating, you want to spray this like every three to five days initially. And then you can go down to less frequent intervals. But again, it breaks down real quick. Hand removal is a great way to go too, you guys. A nickel, a caterpillar. So, I want to spend the majority of my presentation today talking about micromites and root aphids. I'm going to gloss over root aphids pretty quick, but these are major invasive pests, newer to our area in the last three years, that are 
devastating gardens. And there's two really, really tricky things about these guys. So first of all, the mites are microscopic. You cannot see them with the naked eye. And damage doesn't usually manifest um, until you are so heavy in your population that treatment may be either tough or not an option at all. And then with root aphids, again, they're in the soil, feeding on your root system. And so the symptoms above ground you might see may be uh, nitrogen deficiencies, prematurely dropping leaves, uh, limp, uh, thirsty looking leaves because they can't get the food, they can't get the water. And then as the root aphids are taking these bites, they're potentially vectoring in disease. So rot um, is usually the second uh, symptom that you'll find. So these little guys look just like your regular garden variety aphid, but they're in the soil. If populations are too high, you will sometimes see them gather around the collar uh, the, of the crown of the root system or even on the stems. And then when they reach maturity, they grow wings, they fly, and they'll find another plant and recolonize. And the most nasty thing about these guys is they give live birth to pregnant daughters. So the next generation is already ready to go by the time you've even gotten your spray bottle out. So again, with so many of these pests, the issue is reproduction and understanding the life cycle so you can get on top of it. So I wanted to go over this slide real quick, the difference between root aphids and, and fungus gnats, because a lot of gardeners I know think they have fungus gnats, but they have these terrible symptoms. Looks like all sorts of pH imbalances, environmental stressors, nutrient deficiencies, and they think they have no bugs. So this is a really good depiction of the difference. Um, now, your, your root aphid adult colonizer is still gonna have a teardrop-shaped body, and it's gonna have wings. Now those wings are gonna be much longer than the fungus gnat. So the fungus gnat has a longer body, the aphid has longer wings. That has really helped in my IDs. And then again, looking for that teardrop shaped body on the root aphid. Don't get attached to color. I've seen them in every hue of the rainbow just about. I have seen them green, I have seen them amber, I have seen them black, I have seen them gray. So we have a ton of different subspecies uh, right now in our valley, and they are affecting our food source as well. The local grape industry is being hit really hard by root aphids, so it, it's a big deal. I've also seen them on carrots in some community gardens around here, so it's definitely something to, to be aware of. Um, some other differences, the fungus gnat is generally gonna look more angular, like a mosquito. It's gonna have really sharp, crooked lines, where again, the aphid is gonna have that really soft looking body. And the best way to catch them is on a sticky trap. Um, this image is available under Google Images. If you don't wanna ID it yourself, feel free to catch the bug, double bag it, and bring it to one of the Constant Gardener locations and, and we'll help you identify it. So, Micromites. Who in this room's had to deal with micromites? I'm talking about russet, broad, cyclamen. Anybody in the room? We've got a handful. Okay, you guys are ahead of the learning curve because this is the most uphill battle I've ever seen gardeners in our community have to fight. Uh, this is a really tough one. So I did pull some stock images for my first couple slides. The remainder are actually pictures we've taken at Constant Gardener. We're documenting all of our findings. So up top, we've got the broad mite. Um, this is the russet. I like this picture up top here of, of, uh, um, of, the, of the broad mite as well. Excuse me, that is cyclamen, sorry. <laughs> um, so you'll notice that the eggs are elliptical, um, egg-shaped, a little bit longer, and very clear and translucent. And that guy right there is the cyclamen. So they look very much like their eggs. They also look very much like a glandular trichome if you're trying to ID this in flower. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, this guy down there, that nasty little worm looking guy, that's a russet mite. Um, and they are all over cannabis in our valley. We're also starting to hear reports on the local food supply. So this is, this is a really big deal. So um, I wanted to show you guys this picture of broad mites here on the right. They have the weirdest eggs I've ever seen in my life. So they are also elliptical in shape, but you'll notice in that upper right hand corner, they have about 20 to 30 little dots inside that egg casing. Very, very telltale. Now I can see that midst a forest of trichomes in flower if I know what I'm looking for. But again, if you are IDing a pest issue with micromite suspicions in flower, beware that the eggs look like your trichomes. So you have to be very, very careful about IDing. You wanna see an adult. These photos were taken at Constant Gardener. This kind of stuff turns my stomach. Can you guys see this? 
There are hundreds of russet mites crawling on just this one small section of a cannabis leaf. And this is, this is taken at 100 times magnification. Um, all of these mites are less than a millimeter. Most of them are a fraction of a millimeter, like 0 0.05, 0 0.11. They're so small. You have to have a high-powered magnifier to see these. Now, the early onset damage, um, the three different pests that we're seeing, they do express their symptoms slightly different. And that's what I'm collecting right now. I would like to be able to tell you just by looking at the symptoms which of the pests that you may have. Um, and there are some pretty noticeable differences. So usually with broad and cyclamen, we're seeing a lot of leaf mutations. So what's going on here is they're very little bitty mites and they need to take a big bite. And in order to make the plant tissue more malleable to eat, they insert a toxin to weaken the cellulose. That is causing mutations. So you'll start to see these abnormal growth patterns. And again, these symptoms can also mimic viruses, pH imbalances, environmental stressors. So if you come talk to us at Constant Gardener, we're gonna ask you 20 questions, we're gonna rule all that out first. So this is a really good image of really early russet mite damage. I don't think the color's gonna pop, but there is this very faint russeting starting to occur here on the intervenal spaces of, of the leaf blades. Uh, that's very, very telltale. I'll show you how that looks when it progresses in a minute. And if you're an early flower, week two, week three, and you see this, you've got prematurely desiccating pistils, and you haven't sprayed anything on your flowers, and you don't have a high intensity in your environment, beware. They love to eat the pistils. Now, things start to progress mid-range. You'll get really severe hooking. Um, again, more with broad and cyclamen. Where russet, you're seeing more of that russeting pattern. You'll get a lot of tacoing a lot of canoeing, hooking. The leaves are gonna go in every direction except for the direction they're supposed to go. So these are all really important warning signs. Now this was a russet mite infestation. This was my first ID, actually, of russet. This was 2013, uh, my first local ID. The first time I saw russet mite came from Southern Oregon in uh, August 2013, outdoor grower. He'd been on the phone with us for weeks trying to figure out what was going on, why all his buds were airy and loose. Um, he was getting prematurely desiccated pistols, all sorts of canoeing and tacoing. He brought his flower sample up from Southern Oregon. We put our scope on it and we saw it crawling with little worm-like russets. So that was the first case. Um, this was a couple months later in an indoor garden. When we first saw this leaf, we thought this was fungal or bacterial or some sort of disease. We'd never seen anything like this before. It really forced us to look deeper, dig deeper and do some more research. Oh, this is hard to look at. So this is late stage damage. So if gone untreated, if you just think you just need to fertilize a little more nitrogen and things will pull out, this is what may happen. And this is not medicine, folks. There's, there's no medicinal value here. This is compost. And actually, I'm going to recommend that you dump it in boiling water and kill all those little buggers before you compost it so that we don't spread this issue further than we have. Now the other issue that is just starting to hit my radar is the potential for cannabis viruses vectored in by these micro mites. And we know from, from our entomology that pests like thrips are, are known vectors for viruses. This is nothing new, this is just a new vector for us. And I'm gonna let uh, Michelle Wiseman talk more fully about viruses, but these are pictures I took last summer of a plant here in the Willamette Valley. This is a very mosaic-like viral symptom. And so I'm so pleased to have Michelle as my new friend and colleague so we can really solve what's, what's going on here. Here's a, another sample. This is an indoor garden. Again, you get that, that telltale mutation, the mosaic pattern. And this is just not pretty. This is not gonna perform well. So really important to catch early on. So I want to touch on IPM real quick. A lot of folks are grabbing chemical synthetic pesticides to deal with this issue. And I have some concerns about that I want to share with you guys tonight. And I want to talk about the importance of utilizing all the different control measures in integrated pest management. So I like to think of cultural controls as your heart. This is the center of IPM. Horticulture, culture, this is what people can do to make a difference. So this has to do with keeping your garden clean and removing dead spent leaves and limbing her up, lollipopping her, cleaning up that under canopy. I like to call that the bug ladder. Get rid of that right away. 
Um, things like feeding your plants regularly, not letting them dry out excessively between waterings, avoiding stress. This goes so far. Mechanical controls, these are gonna be ways that we're physically intervening with the pest's presence, and that can be as simple as me spraying it with my garden hose and getting it off, or I could do a heat treatment, or I could use some sort of a mechanical kill like a diatomaceous earth, something that would literally slice and dice them up. Chemical treatments, um, if I'm presenting to you guys, I, ho I hope you know that I'm talking about organic uh, chemical treatments. Those are the recommendations I'm gonna bring forward for you. Uh, so those would be actual pesticide products that you're spraying to help remediate these issues, and they definitely have their place in IPM. And then biological treatments, I've put them on the perimeter, not because they're not the most important part of this treatment plan, but because they're not compatible with chemical pesticides. So it's really important to choose your path and then choose it chronologically. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this plan in terms of micromites. So as far as cultural controls go, the very first thing you guys ought to do if you're not already doing it is set up quarantine zones when you bring home a new plant. So this could be a separate space, a grow tent, a bathroom, somewhere that you quarantine your plants for a few weeks and then go through the, the treatment protocols. Uh, that way you can identify an issue early on before you introduce it to, to your main garden. Uh, these should be separated by sealed walls, run a bead, I'm talking about caulking, make sure that this is a totally sealed room, there should be no shared air exchange. If you are forced to share air exchange, please get a help a filter. Um, there's some really good products out there that do a great job of filtering out um, uh, even microscopic uh, pathogens and, and pests. Clean practices, I always keep a bottle of peroxide handy um, in between pruning your plants. Uh, you wanna spray those down so that you're not spreading potential powdery mildew spores or disease or micromites. So keep those tools clean, keep something to clean them handy. I always recommend that people treat new plants as if they are infected. Just imagine they already have a problem and you're gonna set them up for success by giving them a preventative treatment regimen for both pests and disease. I'm a really big fan of pruning and training. I'll be teaching a class at uh, Constant Gardener next month on the 17th about basic pruning and training. This can go a long ways in pest and disease resistance. This is how we get rid of the bug ladder. This is how we open up the plant to more circulation so that powdery mildew can't anchor down. So this is a really simple thing that you can do. And again, this is a cultural control. And then I strongly encourage you guys to get a microscope. And you don't need anything as envy worthy as what Michelle's brought in today, although I'm very jealous. Um, for 15 to $20, you can get 100 times magnifier, no problem. Come see us and we can show you how to use it. A lot of the photos I captured on this slideshow were done with a, with a phone camera. So you plug it into your, your iPhone or your smartphone and you can take pictures and videos. And that's how we're archiving a lot of the pest IDs that we're doing at the shop right now. Very important to look closer. So the mechanical controls that are working really well for micromites, um, heat treatments. Has anybody in this room done a heat treatment either with water or hot air? You have, what was your experience? Four times, great, within about a week, 10 days, something like that, awesome. Yeah, it's really hard to dial this in, you guys. It's not for the beginner, and you definitely want to do a few trial runs without plants that you care about the first time you do this. So the heat treatments are really effective. Again, you can do this by cooking the room, and it sounds like that was your technique. Um, this is with live plants in the room, if done correctly. So this comes from the extension service. Um, I got a recommendation from them that if you can heat a plant to 117 degrees, and there's different recommendations for duration um, of time there, uh, if, you can, if you can heat that plant to 117 degrees for a sufficient amount of time, you will kill all eggs, larvae, and adults and most warm season annual plants can tolerate these temperature extremes. So it's, it's pretty remarkable when you see them bounce back from it. So ways to accomplish this, and generally indoors heat is the problem. So shut off your exhaust fans, keep your circulation fans going. You want even temperatures. You don't want hot spots like you were saying. Thank you, that's so important. You wanna trust your thermometer. 
Um, those large display made in China thermometers that all the grocery stores sell, they have a seven to 10 degree variance. So if I tell you to heat it from 117 to 120 degrees, and you spike it to 130, you're gonna be very unhappy with me when you come back to the shop. So make sure you trust your thermometer. Uh, this comes from the automotive industry. It's a laser thermometer, and it does an incredible job. It's got a couple degree variance, and you can shoot water, soil, leaf surface, your hoods, anything you want to get a really accurate gauge of temperature. So once you've got temperatures up to 117 in your test phase, and you know that you can accomplish that with plants in the room, you have to hydrate the soil. Here's where things go wrong. I tell a lot of people, make sure, the, make sure the soil is evenly moist, and they'll come through the grow room with like a half gallon, and then really quickly splash it on all the plants, and it just runs right down the sides. That's not going to cut it. Uh, you will come back to dead plants. So even hydration throughout the entire soil container. And I would even recommend that you guys do a little bit of a tonic in that water. So add a little kelp, add a little B vitamins, silica, yucca. Yucca extract is my favorite. Uh, this will also boost immune response and yucca specifically really helps with heat stress. So that's a great one to put in the mix as well. So even hydration, if you are a salt-based synthetic gardener, you're going to want to flush those containers out really well with a calcium or sugar flush. Just wipe that slate clean and start fresh. Now if you have an average size grow room, anywhere from 8 by 8 to say 15 by 15, 40 minutes should be sufficient. Um, and like our friend up front, you want to do a succession of those treatments. Now generally, most people are only able to achieve those temperatures if they have the lights on. Now, I do know one gardener who was able to achieve 120 with his lights off by bringing in propane heaters, and that was a lot less stressful on the plants. But again, not something we can all achieve. So you cook them for 40 minutes. Over the course of seven to nine days, you're going to do three treatments, and that is going to be your mechanical control. And then we're going to branch out into other treatments. Um, but I wanted to show you guys the other way to do a heat treatment station here. So again, this really freaks people out the first time I show them. But basically, I built a heat dunk station right here, five-gallon bucket. I just ran around the grow shop and grabbed bamboo stakes and whatnot. We drilled three holes here, three holes here. So I have three slots that give me two different sizes uh, for two different size pots. So I can do a four-inch pot, I can do a six-inch pot, I can do a one-gallon pot. I'm going to fill this with the hottest water I can out of my tap, about halfway, and then I'm going to grab some boiling water, and I'm going to keep adding that until I get to that 117 to 120 degree range. Now, that's like your home remedy. If you have access to a heating element, um, they, they're kind of spendy. They range from about $50 to $300. But you can get a heating element in here, and that will keep temperatures really even and really steady. Um, for a clone, you're going to want to do about a five-minute dunk. This little guy was donated by Driftway Farms for my demonstration today. Thank you guys very, very much. This is one of my favorites. This is Candy Kush. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to saran wrap or tape the soil surface. Remember, I'm inverting this plant. I don't want all my soil falling out. So I just used packing tape and uh, right up to the stem, did a really good job of securing it. I would probably also want to put a stake for some extra support um, here as well. So what I'll do is go ahead and invert this in the setup, show you guys real quick. And that's it. I'm going to set my timer for five minutes. And when it goes off, I'm going to pull her out. So that soil's even hydrated. Five minute dunk tank kills all eggs, larvae, and adults. Again, try this on like a pepper plant the first time you do it. Don't do it on anything that you really, really care about. So the heat treatments are amazing. If you guys have follow-up questions, ask us at the booth or come check in at either of the shops and we can talk a little bit more about that. Sticky traps, barriers, tanglefoot, these are all really effective too, and these are great examples of mechanical controls. Chemical controls, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, pictured here in my little grow tent are a bunch of organic treatment options that work really well. Basically sulfur, enzymes, citric acid, desiccants, pH adjusters, heavy oils, and then botanical oils. These are all working really well, but no one product will solve this problem. You definitely have to take an integrative approach. Pardon? Um, nobody I've talked to recently, but I see some value in capsaicin sprays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come at it from all angles, certainly. And then I wanted to end with uh, biological controls. Oh, yeah, question?
because you use the peroxide? 